All right. So, so far in chapter 28, we have started talking about some of these groups of animals. So, chapter 27 kind of laid the foundation for us and how do we talk about animal biology, especially with regards to how do we classify or decide where to put animals. And so, you had a question, um, you had some questions on the exam addressing those concepts, right? How do we classify animals? And then how do we even just think about how animals are organized together? And so chapter 28 now starts to go into some of those groups. And so we have this big phylogeny that if we're going to try to put all animal phyla onto a single phylogeny, a single evolutionary history, and root them all back to a single animal ancestor, there are certain things that, are, that seem to be the case. And what's interesting is, I don't know if you notice this or not, but when you go through and you look at that and you see how, just, how do genetic data impact, um, you know, phylogenies that were already in place just based on morphology, the, the genetics are, are splitting groups. They're splitting groups, right? Supporting grouping sponges from the rest of animals, right? Supporting putting radiates apart from bilaterians, supporting protostomes apart from deuterostomes, and then taking a group and putting it into its own phylum, and then doing something we didn't see before, and that's separating lophotrochozoans and ectosozoans, right? So all of these genetic data are functioning to do what? To split, split groups apart to tell us this is not this. Okay, that's, that's something important to keep in mind, that the genetics revolution, as far as animal phylogeny is concerned, supported grouping things apart or pulled things apart that used to be grouped together. Okay, no part of the genetic revolution said we should group animals together that we didn't group together before. It's interesting. It's an interesting uh, point to make and something interesting to point out. Now, last time, not last time, actually not last time, because last time we did our exam, last time, last time, on Wednesday, we talked about one group of lophotrochozoan protostomes. And what was that group? Because we talked about sponges, not a lophotrochozoan protostome. We talked about cnidarians, also not a lophotrochozoan protostome, because if, if, if you're not a triploblast, you can't be a protostome or a deuterostome. Right? Right? Okay. And so we talked about one phylum that is a lophotrochozoan protostome. And what was that? The mollusks. Okay? And so mollusks are within that group lophotrochozoa, which has a pretty significant polytomy. Right? Where you take one branch and you split it into multiple branches, which is an indication that we don't really understand how the phyla in that group group together. Right? Remember talking about that? What about within mollusca? Do we have an easy time grouping the classes of mollusks together? We don't. There's a polytomy just within that phylum, which is an indication of what? That we don't really have a clear idea of how you would take all mollusks and root them back to a single ancestral mollusk, right? Which may, in fact, be an indication that there was no ancestral mollusk, Although that would require there to be separate creations, and that sounds a lot like what a, what a biblical idea of origins is, right? Wow. Right? Yes. 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 Okay. So nematodes, we're, we're going to start talking about another phylum, and this phylum, nematoda, is part of another polytomy, this time in our other group of protostomes are ectosozoans. But inside of this phylum, we do not have a hard time grouping them all together. This is a phylum with very, very little structural diversity. Okay? This phylum is known commonly as the roundworms. And they're called that because if you were to cut them into a cross section anywhere in the body, you get almost a perfect circle. Almost a perfect circle. 
They are pseudocelomates. What does that mean? They do not have a true coelom, right? And you're like, how do you not have a true cavity, right? You either have a cavity or you don't. What is a false coelom? Yeah, Allison. Yeah, it's only lined by mesoderm on one side of that cavity. This is where we got to have the wonderful conversation where if you don't line the cavity on both sides, you can't have musculature lining your gut, which means the only way to push material through your gut is to keep packing material in or to have enormous pressure inside the body, inside that cavity. Remember this conversation? I think it was on a Friday, and I left you with like your thought of the weekend where you could prop open the anus and, and shoot material out of these roundworms. And these are nematodes. And I said, if you happen to pass an intestine, right? You remember this conversation? I do, very, very <laughs> fondly. Okay, well now we get to talk about them, nematodes. They're in this group, ectosozoa, and one of the things that that means is that they have to molt in order to grow. That seems to be true of all the phyla in ectosozoa that in order to grow, they actually have to shed this non-living casing that surrounds the animal. Insects have this non-living casing, crustaceans, spiders, everybody's favorite animals, right? <coughs> Bless you, nematodes as well. In order to grow, they have to shed this external casing and then they can grow as they rebuild a new external casing, okay? And you're like, wow, this, it's awesome, Dr. Ingo. I know exactly why they're important, because they're ectosozoans. That's not why they're important. Um, many nematodes are parasites of vertebrates. This is why they're important. In fact, over half of all of the described species in this phylum are parasitic. Most parasitologists think that there's at least one specific nematode parasite for every animal on Earth. That every animal on Earth has its own nematode parasite just for it. That it doesn't have to share with anyone else. We, on the other hand, have at least five or six dozen different nematode parasites that will take up residence in our body. No questions asked. And so what that means, if that's true, is that for every described species on Earth, there is a nematode parasite waiting to be described by somebody. What it also means is that if you erased everything, you got rid of every animal on Earth except for the nematodes, you would still find where every single animal was because you would leave its nematode parasite behind. Right? So that's kind of fun. The animal's gone, but its nematode parasite is still there. You add to that that nematodes are just pack the soil virtually everywhere on Earth. If you were to erase everything on Earth except for the nematodes, you would still see the contours of the land because you've left the nematodes in the soil and where all the animals were and their nematode parasite would just be sitting there. Gives you an idea of how many nematodes there are and how ubiquitous these organisms are. Okay, but let's talk about some specific types of nematode parasites. First type, hookworms. So of all of our nematodes, these are by far uh, the most dangerous of the intestinal nematode parasites. They are voracious feeders and they're blood feeders. So most intestinal parasites, they just eat whatever you feed them. Right? They sit in your intestines waiting for you to eat, and they eat what you feed them. But hookworms are not satisfied with what you feed them. They burrow through your intestinal wall and, and eat blood. And they eat way more blood than they need. Why? Because they can. And, um, and so they, they have all of the nematode parasites are, are the most dangerous. Okay? Of, of the nematode intestinal parasites. Another group... Uh, Ascaris, it's a genus of human intestinal roundworms. And of all of the intestinal nematodes, these are by far the most common. Current estimates are 1.5 billion people worldwide infected with Ascaris lumbricoides. Statistically, in North America, you're looking at about a one in four chance of having this parasite. 
It's still a big deal, though. The the females are no bigger than four to eight inches in length, and occur in numbers no greater than two to three hundred. So no big deal. Uh, current estimates are 1.5 billion worldwide and one in every four in the United States. Right? Yeah, Anders. Depends. Usually not. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So the only pathology you tend to have with this parasite, there are, there are three types of pathology. One, shh, as larvae, the parasites burrow through your body, erupt in your lungs, climb up your trachea, and get swallowed. So if you have a lot do that at the same time, you can have significant lung damage. There was a graduate student working on this parasite that didn't like his roommate and seeded his roommate's breakfast with eggs of this parasite and killed his roommate because they all erupted in the lungs at basically uh, the same time. But that, that yeah, no, no, no joke. Um, so that, that, that tends to be very rare. That's very rare to have that happen. Usually you just have... You know, maybe you ate something contaminated with the eggs. You have a few dozen that erupt into your lungs at the same time, but they're really, really tiny, and you handle it. Maybe you get a cough, you're fine. The other one is if you have several thousand in your intestines, they can cause intestinal blockages, right? You've got an eight-inch long worm. You can pack. So th this, let me, I want to tell you a story. So the parasite I worked on for my PhD is similar to this parasite, but it's a raccoon parasite, and it's an intestinal roundworm. And so what we would do, uh, we worked with fur trappers, so we didn't actually have to kill any raccoons, so we didn't have to fill out any paperwork. It was wonderful. Uh, they, would, they would trap the raccoons, they would, they would skin them, and then they would throw the bodies in a pile, and we would just come and take what we wanted. But we're, we'd just take the, the, like, the gut. And so then we'd go through the intestinal tract looking for these parasites. Some of the raccoons had such a heavy infection that the worms were packed so tightly in their intestines that you could not only see the shape of the worm through the intestinal wall, you could see the color of the worm through the intestinal wall because they had stretched the intestinal wall so thin because of how densely they were packed in there. It's wonderful. I mean, you could almost count them without even cutting open the intestines. So that's another one. And then if uh, for some reason they get uncomfortable in your intestines, sometimes they'll move up and uh, some people will choke on them when they're sleeping. But that's, that's rare as well. That's rare as well. So let's put that out there. But again, three out of every four of you are likely uninfected. So, <laughs> all right. The next one, filarial worms. Uh, filarial worms are nematode parasites that are transmitted from human to human by mosquitoes, primarily. Although not just humans, sometimes something else is the definitive host. But they are like malaria in that way, except for malaria, the mosquito is the final host. In these filarial worms, we are the final host, or some other animal, and the mosquitoes carry the uh, intermediate host. Any of you heard of elephantiasis? It's a ridiculous name. It literally means infected by elephants, which is absurd, but it is a filarial worm. And so the worms, they, they clog your lymphatic ducts, which lead to swelling of your limbs and make your limbs look like elephant limbs. All right. So here's some information about nematodes. They are pseudocelomates. I already told you that. Limits the complexity of the circulatory systems. Keeps muscles from forming around the gut. I told you that. It's what makes them an, an effective cannon. Um, but again, we already had that conversation. But as pseudocelomates, this is something that's also true of, of all pseudocelomates, is they grow in very predictable ways. So predictable, in fact, that every single adult individual has the exact same number of cells. This is true of all pseudocelomates. Every single adult individual has the exact same number of cells. Which, that's cool. Like, if you were to compare you to me, I would have far more cells than you do because I'm way more massive than you are, right? But if we were both nematodes, we would have the same exact number of cells even if I was more massive than you were. And so what that means is they're actually great model organisms. Plus, nobody really cares if you want to do research on nematodes. Nobody is bothered by it. 
Um, and so that's another thing that makes them great model organisms. Yeah, Chris. Is it just, is it nematodes in general or is it? Pseudocelomates in general. So nematodes are pseudocelomates. There are other animal phyla that are pseudocelomates. One of those is uh, rotifera. Again, this isn't a zoology class. We don't get to talk about all these animal groups, but they are also pseudocelomates and they have this as well. Yeah, a set number of cells. In case you're wondering, it's called uteli. The set, having a set number of cells. Yeah, Micah. So how do they have the set number of cells if they grow? The cells are just bigger. Oh. Yep. So, the, yeah, because, I mean, so the parasite I worked with, adults range from 4 millimeters to 8 inches. And I know I just switched systems there, but 8 inches is like 20 centimeters. But anyways, nobody, people don't, anyway, sorry. So, I mean, there's a huge range in the adult size, but there's the same number of cells. It's just the cells are bigger. Cells are bigger. It's a good question. All right. So here is a picture of uh, C. elegans. Oh, no. This is not C. elegans. This is Heterodera glycines, uh, another nematode. Oh, yeah. And so this is a, uh, uh, this, this is a free-living uh, nematode. C. elegans is a free-living nematode. It is not a parasitic nematode species. There's another figure from the text of another one that I didn't put in the slide, but we got to talk about this. So this is Dracunculus, is the genus. It's, it's virtually been eradicated from humans. They're, they're commonly referred to as guinea worms, and this is one of the few big wins that we have had in the area of parasitology. In the area of viruses and bacteria, we've had a lot of wins of eradicating pathogens. We have not in parasites, but this is a big win, guinea worms. Uh, virtually nobody has guinea worms anymore. But the thing about guinea worms is the adult females hang out subcutaneously near the feet. And what they'll do is they'll lay eggs that your immune system will react to form this big like pustule that then will pop and the eggs will be released and then they'll get into water and they'll find like their intermediate host. You'll drink contaminated water and then you'll, you know, completes the life cycle. But... In order to get the adult females out, because they can, be, they can be 30, 40 inches long, just packed in your subcutaneous space underneath the skin and your feet, you have to slowly wind them out, like a centimeter per day. If you do any more than that, it, she'll rip, and she'll just spill her contents all underneath your skin, and your immune system will overreact, and you'll, ha you'll go into anaphylactic shock. So you have to actually slowly wind this parasite out over weeks, if not months. Just fantastic. But have you ever seen the, the emblem of medicine? It's called the fiducius. It's like a stick with snakes wrapped around it. It's, it's actually based on this parasite. It's one of the oldest forms of medicine. It's not a snake, but it looks kind of like a snake, but also like a worm. So this is a cool one. Uh, but raccoons are also infected with these. So we've virtually eradicated it from humans, but not from raccoons. And so when you skin a raccoon, if you ever in your life skin a raccoon, there's a pretty good probability you'll find one of these dracunculus worms hanging out down around the feet. Yeah, Mike. We've eradicated it, but that's just 2.59 Yeah, but it's for reinfections from animals. So, and 3.5 million, it is a lot of people. But compared to what, what, it, what it used to be, and that's, that's likely an old number, too, because I don't know how old the data are from this textbook. Um, but if you pull something from the last couple of years, a, a journal article, that number is much, much smaller. Yeah, Emerson. Well, does it just like, can't lay the eggs, leave, and then the eggs can get released to, like, pop in, like, a, like a pimple? Where would it go, though? Lay the, you said lay the eggs and leave? Yeah, no, it, it just hangs out there. It, it's massive. There's nowhere for it to go. I mean, it's, it, yeah, I mean, the adult females may be 30, 40 inches long. There's, there's nowhere for it to go. Yeah. So if that long, is it up or is it Yeah, in some places. And then there's just, I mean, there's, there's an impressive amount of subcutaneous space if you want to try to pack uh, material in there. It's similar to what you do, like if you, if you get a tattoo, you fill that subcutaneous space with ink. I mean, you're just filling it with worm. And it, you get, I mean, it, it tends to be obvious. If you've got a really good-sized female there, you can see her, but you can't really do anything about her except for slowly wind her out. 
Yeah, Aiden. Why would this is fun. Um, because it's, I mean, it's very, very dangerous. I mean, it's very dangerous. The skin is not very thick, and if you cut too deep and you cut into the, the female worm, you're, you're going to elicit a massive immune response. Plus, you'd have to cut a large amount of material if you were going to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, you, I mean, you can just, you can treat the person with antiparasitics. Uh, but then the then you have to wait for like your immune system to wall off the adult female worm after she dies, or you still have to wind her out, but she's dead now and no longer alive. Yeah, Cameron. Can you be infected like when there's only one bigworm at once, or do you have multiple in your body? Oh, both are possible. Okay. So yeah. But if, what happens if you only have like a single one as a male? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Males, I'm trying to remember of this species. We have another species of nematode where the males have never been described. So we know that the males exist, but nobody's ever described them, which is probably an indication that the male is microscopic and the female is macroscopic. And I don't know about, I don't know about this species. And then you have other, other nematode species. Oh, no, never mind. That's not a nematode. I was going to say there's another parasite species, not a nematode, though, where the male lives inside of a groove on the female's body. So, but that's not a nematode. Yeah, Allison. Um, I found on Google that in plants of an annual order, 30 cases of guinea worms. Of guinea worms, 30. Yeah. So I'm telling you, it's a, it's a big win. Like this, we've, 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 done some, we've done some good work, too. I mean, really... You have to be drinking water from something that is very obviously not a great place to drink water. So, anyways. All right? Okay. So here's the life cycle of C. elegans. This C. elegans is a free-living nematode, one of the most prolific model organisms that we have. Very easy to grow in a lab. Um, yeah, nobody really cares if you do some research on it. And they have very predictable development. Very nice and orderly and organized uh, development. All right. You ready for a lecture break? I'm ready for a lecture break. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a couple of minutes, maybe three, and I want you to come up with an idea of, of where parasites came from. Okay? So you basically have two different paradigms that you can use for explaining parasites, right? You can explain parasites from like a methodological naturalism paradigm, where it's like, of course, we'd expect there to be parasites because it's a great way to feed, right? You just take advantage of a host. It's a nice, reliable food source. You can simplify your body into just a reproductive machine. But then you've got another paradigm in which you have this design, right? In which you have a creator. And, and according to what scripture teaches about origins, a creator that called his creation good, right? And then there's some question on... You know, what, what does that mean? Although the original audience, the early Hebrews, understood it to mean kind of like a paradise. And uh, so these don't seem to kind of fit in, in that uh, kind of an understanding of what creation was like. And so where do parasites come from under that paradigm? All right. Take two, maybe three minutes. Talk that over starting now. What about methodological? 
myself or something. Okay. All right. So one thing I want to tell you, and it, it, it's it's going to end up on the recording. I guess I could have paused the recording. If you if you're wondering if you have a parasite, it's very easy to check. One is you you t- you collect a fecal sample, and two you take it to a vet and say I'm concerned this has parasites. Don't tell them where it came from. If they ask, <laughs> if they ask. Just, just leave, <laughs> and 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 I can talk to you about how to check for yourself. Uh, but otherwise, you can you can figure it out pretty easily, or you can just be like, you know what, I don't care, because I feel pretty good, and I'm just gonna keep believing. <laughs> and so, all right. So, how do we explain this? What do we do with parasites? I mean, you could kill them, right? Yeah, the, the, what, something that's interesting is we tend to treat most parasites the same way. And by the same way, I mean using the same pharmaceutical. There are some that have a more difficult site in which they live, or there's just something really unique about them, so you have to design a treatment specifically for that parasite. But that tends to be pretty rare. Most parasites, whether they're you know head lice or intestinal roundworms or pinworms, which are probably my favorite nematode. Um, and if you if you don't know about pinworms, go go read about pinworms uh, today. Uh, anyways, you think guinea worms are disturbing pinworm. Anyway, sorry. Um, but yeah, whether you treat a lot of them the same way, you you just use what a general antiparasitic and it kills them. But I, I don't mean like how do we deal with parasites when you're infected with them. I mean how do we fit them in? to a paradigm that talks about the intricate nature of God's design and gives you kind of this understanding that pathology, disease, and death are a result of man's rebellion against their creator and rather than part of the creation itself. Levi, do you have something? Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, I would think Okay. Yeah. Um, but some people think that parasites are important because they help to regulate the population. Okay. Yeah. Control population. Yeah, yeah the, the thing is that, is that that's absolutely true. Disease will regulate population growth, but it's a horrible way to regulate population growth for obvious reasons. One, there's pathology associated with it. And so believe it or not, being eaten by something is way better for an animal than slowly dying from a disease. Plus, when you're using disease to regulate population growth, diseases don't stay where they start. They, they spill over into other things. So it's really, it's not a great way to design something to, to protect against that. I mean, it, it does regulate population growth, but there are much better ways to do that, right? Sharks regulate population growth much better than disease does. Yeah. Um, is it possible that parasites are a reflection of a symbiotic relationship? 
Absolutely. That what you had at, be, at the beginning is something more mutualistic, like what we talked about with fungi and algae, right? And we talked about some of these examples, um, insects and angiosperms, something more mutualistic and then has deteriorated. And it's interesting because there's something about some of these parasites. Nematodes, whether they're a parasitic nematode or a free-living nematode, they look very similar. Again, there's not an enormous amount of variation within that group. But some of these groups, the parasites look nothing like the free-living forms. And so it's, it's hard to imagine that they began free-living and, and, and merged into something that required a host. It seems more like they were designed always to live inside other animals. And then the question is, like, why, why do we need animals designed to live inside other animals? You know what's interesting? I want to share this with you. This is not, this is not disturbing, I don't think. Um, a lot of what I've been sharing today is disturbing. I realize that. It's not like I'm, I don't understand it's disturbing. I do. It's just fun. It's like when you... Anyway, sorry. Um, nematode parasites regulate your immune system and in many cases get it to behave the way it ought to. So much so that they are using nematode parasites to treat people with autoimmune diseases, with uncontrollable aller allergic reactions to very common material, because the nematode parasites, if they're in, like we talked about human intestinal roundworm, you asked a question, no, you asked a question, Jeremiah, of, of, of would it hurt you? Was it you that asked that? Who asked, oh no, it was Anders. Gosh, third time's the charm. In, in, in reasonable numbers, even if you had a couple hundred of the human intestinal roundworm, you, you very likely would experience no pathology. But your immune system would be significantly more likely to behave properly and to not overreact to material it should not overreact to. So much so, again, that they are using these to treat autoimmune diseases. I had a colleague at Biola that has Crohn's disease and has been in remission for almost 10 years because he consumed nematode eggs and every five years takes a booster and and replaces those that are dying and it's awesome and so if he were to check if he were to take a fecal sample to a vet and said i think this might be infected it absolutely would be and yet the only pathology he has is remission from crohn's disease you're like wow it's a great pathology right and so there's something about these organisms that almost look like that they are, they might be part of our immune system. Like they were designed to be part of who we are and to do something I think more than just to make sure our immune system works properly. Yeah, Chris. How does the immune system just like not freak out when there's a parasite? It depends on where it is. So uh, most of these nematode parasites, they secrete, uh, they secrete materials that, that downregulate the part of your immune system that would fight the parasite's presence. But that's also the part of your immune system that overreacts to material that it should not fight against. It's not the part of your immune system that fights against bacteria or viruses or fungal pathogens. It's the part of your immune system that fights against like pollen and uh, gluten and things like that that you, you really, there's no reason for your body to be fighting against it. So if you have an autoimmune disease and you take uh, you take a white blood cell count, you're going to have what's called eosinophilia, which is a, an, a large number of a specific type of white blood cell called an eosinophil. And that's because that's the part of your immune system that is overreacting to the presence of something it shouldn't. That's very characteristic of it. Or if you're having an allergic reaction to something, you're going to get eosinophilia. But that's also the white blood cells that attack these parasites. And so they downregulate that part of your immune system, keep it from producing eosinophils, which keeps you from overreacting to the presence of gluten or pollen or something that your body really shouldn't be overreacting to. And so it's wonderful. It's like it's a, it's a wonderful pairing, right? You're like, sure, I'll have a couple hundred hookworms and whipworms in my gut if like, I'm, like my body will allow me to eat. Yeah. Anyways, there's some other ideas that I have, but we'll have to talk about those laters of what, what laters 
of what parasites may have been designed to do. But you can't really get around the fact that some animals look like they were perfectly de de designed to live inside other animals, to reproduce inside other animals, and to get from one animal to another to complete its life cycle. It's cool stuff. All right. So this is not written on a slide, but you should have this information. So there's a feature called segmentation, and it is present in three animal phyla. Those phyla are Annelida, Arthropoda, and Chordata, or Chordata. I've heard both. I don't know which one's proper to pronounce here. So Annelida, Arthropoda, and Chordata. This right here is our phylum. And so segmentation is a, at least some degree of repeated elements in your design. And so in chordates, the only place you really see it is in the abdominal muscles, your vertebrae, your ribs, where you get that, those repeated elements of design. Now, earlier in development, you, you see it a little bit more clearly, that segmentation, again, repeated elements, um, you know, over and over again. Annelids, these are like earthworms, leeches, clam worms. If you don't know what a clam worm is, you, you can look it up later. They're pretty neat looking. Um, but these are very clearly segmented. It's like the entire body is just segment after segment after segment. And there are only a couple of systems that persist through all of them. The digestive system extends through all of them. The reproductive system and the nervous system extend through all of them. And circulatory. But like the excretory system is repeated every segment. You can see this segmentation very clearly on the outside of an earthworm, right? I don't know if you've ever paid attention to an earthworm, but you can see those segments, those repeated units. Arthropoda, these are insects, crustaceans, spiders, millipedes and centipedes. The millipedes and centipedes, again, you can see that very clear segmentation. During the development of insects and spiders and crustaceans, you see those segments, but then they fuse together, oftentimes within the egg still, into big regions. But you still have very clear segmentation, okay? Very clear segmentation, very clear segmentation, somewhat clear segmentation depending on what stage in development. And so because of this shared feature and the complexity of how do you generate the same unit time after time after time after time, linked all three of these together and the idea was that arthropods and annelids were basically ancestral to chordates that the idea was is that chordates like us shared a more recent common ancestor with annelids and arthropods than they did any other animals because of the segmentation but what you have is this right here is an LP. What does that stand for? Stand for, not fur. I'll give you a hint. This is an EP. And this is a D. Any ideas? This is a Lophotrochozoan protostome. This is an Ectocozoan protostome. And this is a Deuterostome. So now if you want to get back to the, the supposed ancestor of these three phyla, you have to go to your original bilaterally symmetrical animal. That's now an issue because then now you have to explain why don't the rest of our phyla have segmentation. So now the idea is that segmentation evolves separately in all three of these groups. Okay, Does that make sense? So historically, we would link these groups together, but then the whole protostome deuterostome thing split this from these two, and then the whole lophotrochozoan ectocozoan thing split these two from each other. And so now, again, if you're going to go to the last ancestor of all three of these phyla, you'd have to go to the original bilaterally symmetrical animal, if it ever existed. You'd have to go through a lot of polytomies to get there. Okay. All right, all of that to address this question. How are annelids similar to arthropods? Both are segmented, bilaterally symmetrical UC limates with cuticles. 
Okay. Already mentioned this, the segmentation of arthropods is masked through that process of fusing segments together. It's called tagmatization, that fusion of segments. And in insects, you have three tagma. Anyone know what they are? Three body segments that each are formed by the fusion of segments. Head, thorax, and abdomen. Right? Yes. Uh, some other similarities. Both phyla have CT, hair-like extensions that extend through the cuticle. Earthworms use these to anchor themselves down so that they can move efficiently through soil. Arthropods use these to sense their environment. Have you ever noticed that spiders are really hairy? A lot of spiders, not all spiders, but a lot of spiders are really hairy. Those are those CT, and what they are, they're, they're, they're tactile receptors, helping them feel their environment. Both phyla have complex nervous systems and excretory systems. And so there are some similarities here, okay? But we already know we've got a problem because genetic data split these into two different groups, lophotrochozoan protostomes and ectosozoan protostomes, right? Genetic data split them apart. So now we can start talking about some of the differences. Yeah, they do share some similarities, but annelids have a closed circulatory system and are usually monoecious. This is a term we talked about last week, right? Do you remember what monoecious means? One house means both male and female live in the same house. One individual is both male and female, bless you, produces both male and female gametes. Arthropods typically are dioecious, two houses, male and female in separate houses. Wow, I don't know why that came first. But annelids are lophotrochozoans, whereas arthropods are ectosozoans. So what this presents is an issue behind saying segmentation is the ancestral condition because it can't be. So segmentation therefore has to evolve in all three phyla or just always a part of the organisms that are grouped into those categories. Okay, we've already addressed this question. Knowing that humans are also segmented, how do we explain the presence of segmentation in these phyla? We have a specific term that we've used I, don't, I think it's been a while. We talked about homology versus a different term. It's been a while. Analogy or convergent evolution. Remember we talked about it when we talked about something being a biomechanical necessity, right? This idea of convergence. So this segmentation can't be homologous. That is, it can't come from a shared ancestor because then the rest of animal phyla would have had to have lost it. Or, yeah, so it can't be homologous, so it must be an example of convergent evolution, an analogous feature. Or it's just something, it's a design element that is a recurring design element for specific purposes. Another instance of something that is biomechanic, a biomechanical necessity. Okay. All right, so these CT here that both annelids and arthropods have, we use the number of these CT to actually group annelids into separate groups. And you don't need to know what those groups are. You just need to know about annelids. Uh, but one of those groups are the oligochetes and earthworms. Here's like the poster, the poster child for this group, oligochetes. It's beautiful, right? Here you can see the very clear segmentation. And if you look internally, you'll see the excretory system repeated in every segment. Yeah? It's called the clitellum. It functions to create a mucus to coat the eggs into an egg sac as they're developing. Yeah, Micah. So you see it in our abdominal muscles, our vertebral column, and, and our rib cage, where you get those repeated units. Now, earlier on in development, you can see it a little bit more clearly. So here's 
Basics of an earthworm. Yeah, Faith. Yes, the oligochetes. The eggs? Yeah. yeah, so the eggs, yeah. So what you see is um, when, when earthworms uh, are mating, they'll start creating like a mucus, uh, I don't even know what you would call it, like a mucus coat that'll start moving its way along the worm. And as it does, it passes by various openings along the worm that will deposit male gametes, female gametes, and then they'll fuse together within that coat, and then they'll form zygotes, and then now you have that mucus coat forms into like an egg case with several eggs inside, sometimes dozens, and then the embryo develop inside the eggs will hatch, and then they'll start to erupt from this now egg coat. And so you can find plenty of videos if you want to of worms erupting from these egg cases. It's pretty fun. All right. So here are the different groups of annelids. Here's earthworms, oligochetes. Here are leeches. And then here is a, a polychaete uh, known as a feather duster. And in all of these, you can see the segmentation in these. The leeches, uh, they don't have any CT. They don't have uh, those, those fibers, uh, those hairs. Uh, but they still have the very clear segmentation, both externally and internally. All right. Any other questions about annelids? Okay. We have one last question that we'll get to today. Why are there so many arthropods? Why are there so many arthropods? So now we're going to deal with another one of our segmented phyla. This one we won't deal with until, I don't know, maybe this week. Um, on Wednesday or Friday. Why are there so many arthropods? So you may not have even known that there are so many arthropods, but arthropods account for 85% of all described animal species. So 85% of all described animal species are in a single phylum, arthropoda. So regardless of your view of origins, you, you have an interesting issue to try to explain of why is a single phylum so speciose, which means includes a number of species. Why is there a single phylum that has so many species? So really, it has to do with the effectiveness of that design. Again, regardless of what your view of origins is, there's, there's no doubt that there's something really effective about being an arthropod that leads to a number of niches that you can occupy. I think there are 170,000 described species of beetle, right? That's just one group, one order of, of this group. So the cuticle is made of chitin. Where else have we seen this before? Chitin. The fungi, right? And I told you then, you really only see chitin one other place, and that's in the exoskeleton of arthropods. Insects, crustaceans, spiders, millipedes, centipedes. Every segment has a pair of appendages. So if you have several segments fused together, you should be able to figure out how many segments fuse together to form a region of the body by the number of appendages that are there. Okay, so remember I told you about insects. They have three tagma. What are they again? Head, thorax, and abdomen. The thorax contains the legs. How many legs are there? Six, if it's an insect. So how many segments fuse together to form the thorax? Three. Look at that. That's critical thinking at its finest right there. Six legs. Every segment has a pair of appendages. So if there are six, there are three pairs, right? So you, during development of an insect, if you were to watch it happen, like say a, a maggot developing into a fly within the pupil, within the pupa, you should see three segments fused together to form that abdomen. Most species have three tagma. We already mentioned this, head, thorax, and abdomen. And within here, we have another polytomy. 
So it shouldn't come as a surprise to you now, whenever you are trying to take an enormous amount of variety and root it back to a single ancestor, a lot of times you're gonna end up with a polytoma, which again is an indication of what? That we do not understand the evolutionary history of this group. Or if your view of origins allows for it, that you're trying to root things back to an ancestor that never existed, right? if your view of origins would allow for that possibility. So within this phylum, we have trilobites, trilobita. We mentioned these already when we were talking about the Cambrian explosion in chapter 27. These are an extinct group of arthropods. Uh, Mary Mariapida, Mariapods, these are um, millipedes and centipedes, very obvious segmentation. Chelicerata. These are spiders, scorpions, horseshoe crabs, hexapoda, insects, and some other groups. And finally, crustacea. And in here, some of the characteristics that you find inside of these groups. The body plan of this is just an incredibly successful body plan, right? You have a nice, hard, external skeleton. Because of how you develop and fusing those segments, you have flexibility in terms of how your adult body plan ends up being built. And so what it allows for is just a, an enormous variety of organisms. Re really, regardless of what your view of origins is, it's a really nice design allowing for these organisms to occupy a variety of different niches. So if you have several different separate creations, they're still going to have a wonderful potential to get in and to diversify as they enter in different niches. Or if you have one single ancestor, still a great deal of potential to get in and to occupy different niches. All right? Real quick. Uh, you, you, it'd be helpful to know that there is a polytomy there. Are you talking about should you know these groups and their defining characteristics? We'll talk more about that on Wednesday. All right, we are out of time. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your Monday.